My name is Ed Howard. I'm with the Alliance for Health Reform. I want to thank you for coming. I want to welcome you on behalf of Senator Rockefeller, Senator Blunt, our board of directors, to this uh, program to look at health and health care and health insurance in rural America. Now, we know that compared to urban areas, uh, people in rural areas are more likely to be low income, more likely to be uninsured, less likely to have employer-sponsored coverage, uh, which of course is the most prevalent way of getting coverage in this country. We know that geography poses a particular problem to gaining access to needed care in some rural areas. And we know that, just as is in the case of urban areas, that the Affordable Care Act is going to have a major effect on health care access and coverage in rural areas. So today, we're going to uh, take a look at these issues as well as potential policy changes that might address some of the challenges that you're going to be hearing about. And we're very pleased to have as our co-sponsor in today's program the Centene Corporation, which contracts to provide Medicaid coverage in, what, almost 20 states uh, and operates a number of related services like nurse call centers and behavioral health. Uh, and co-moderating our discussion today, we have Zane Yates, uh, who's Centene's Senior Director of Business Development. Zane, thanks for being with us. Thank you, Ed. It's a pleasure to be here. And on behalf of Centene Corporation, I'm delighted to join the Alliance for Health Reform and our panelists for today's briefing. Thanks to the Alliance, these briefings allow us to tackle tough health issues such as rural health by increasing our understanding about the federal government, the states, the healthcare industry, and others responding to these challenges. The briefings also provide opportunities to learn about innovative approaches, initiatives that can help improve the access, delivery, and quality of care. And at Centene, we're focused on coordinating health services, recipients of Medicaid, Medicare, and our programs to help the uninsured. We're pleased that this is an area of great interest to the Hill staff, as well as the policy, advocacy, and research communities. I'm looking forward to today's discussions and this briefing and the opportunity to exchange views and discuss best practices in rural health. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Zane. Uh, a couple of housekeeping items. There are materials in your packets, including the PowerPoint presentations of our speakers. Uh, there are, there's also a one-page sheet of materials that lists all the written stuff that's in your packets and a bunch of other things, all available online, excuse me, online at the Alliance website, which is allhealth.org. Um, if you're watching on C-SPAN and you have access to a computer or another inter internet device, you can get that same material at allhealth.org. There'll be a webcast and a podcast available next week on our website, and a few days after that, a transcript of the briefing in case you want to go back and uh, relive those exciting words you're about to hear. <laughs> We'd like at the appropriate time if you would um, fill out the blue evaluation form that's in your, in your packet so that we can improve these programs for you as we go along. There's also a green question card. Once we get to the Q&A, there are microphones that you can use and you can fill out the green card and write a question and we'll try to address it up here. Uh, about that evaluation, by the way, uh, normally about a fourth of you take the trouble to fill it out and we're grateful and we hate the other three fourths. <laughs> <laughs> but we have a bribe um, that we commonly do with our colleagues at Centene. If that number rises to 35%, uh, the Alliance is going to donate $50 to support the Healthy Corners project of the D.C. Central Kitchen. Now, that project, which I just learned about, promises, I'm sorry, promotes community health by promoting the availability of fresh fruits and vegetables in D.C., um, specifically in the city's so-called food deserts. Uh, so if 50 percent of you complete the evaluation, will go to 100 bucks. How's that? So uh, do we have, yes, there is a, a URL at the bottom of that slide in case you want to add your own donation to um, the one that the Alliance will be making. So uh, that's the end of the commercials. Uh, we have a great panel for you. We're going to 
ask them to give relatively brief presentations, and then we'll open it up for discussion among the panelists and your questions. And we're going to start with Keith Mueller. Uh, Keith, who's both the director of the University of Iowa Department of Health Management and Policy and head of the Center for Rural Health Policy Analysis at the uh, Rural Policy Research Institute, RUPRI. Uh, we're pleased to welcome Keith back. He is Mr. Rural Health. Thanks very much for being with us. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. Thanks to Centene and the Alliance for sponsoring this and all of you for being here. My task in the opening presentation is to provide some overview backdrop to what the current state of affairs is in rural health in America and some of the efforts underway to improve that. The current situation, and it's, the slide says circa 2010 because that's the date of the data that support uh, what's in this particular slide. Uh, as Ed was saying, the employment-based insurance situation in, in rural America is lower than it is in urban America when we look at characteristics of the uninsured. There have been recent increases in coverage in rural America, primarily through public programs and in particular through the Medicaid program. That's really a function of, as a proportion, uh, when you look at residents below poverty, the income below poverty is lower in rural than it is in urban, hence higher eligibility for even the current Medicaid program before any expansion. And difficulties that rural Americans have in finding broad and affordable coverage uh, in their individual and small group markets. In availability of services in rural America, most of the shortage areas in the country, whichever profession you pick, whether it's primary care, mental health, dental health, uh, those shortage areas are disproportionately present in rural. Providers who are our bedrock for acute care, mental health, oral health in rural America operate on much tighter margins than most of their counterparts in urban America. And we are in a situation, though, in, the, in which there is more stability in the rural provider arena in rural America today than there was when I started in this field a few decades back uh, because of a lot of the policy interventions that have been tested, tried, and implemented uh, during those years. So one of the things that we talk about a lot when we talk about rural America and the provider communities is maintaining the success stories that we've had through changes in payment policy, changes in how we recruit and retain professionals, and so on. So that's the backdrop for what it looks like now in rural America. Next, I'm going to intersect that with some of the provisions that are in the, Affordable, the Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act, otherwise ACA. Uh, on the insurance side, insurance reforms that have already been implemented during the first couple of years of the ACA have had an impact, such as coverage for children in up to the age of 26, uh, creation of an essential benefit package that becomes the baseline, which is an improvement over mo much of what has been available in the individual and small group market in rural America, uh, the, the elimination of lifetime limits on benefits financially for households, and the removal of pre-existing conditions as a reason either to deny total access to coverage or to say you can have coverage except for the condition that's a pre-existing condition, known sometimes as a rider on insurance policies. So that's one aspect of the ACA. Another is the new marketplaces that are developing now in the individual uh, and small employer. More rapidly on the individual side, as, as you've been reading, than on the small employer side, but developing in both. And we're beginning to see some of the results of that in terms of what the premiums are that the health plans have said they will be charging uh, in these new marketplaces around the country. And then finally, the intersection on the insurance side with expansion of the Medicaid program to the 138 uh, percent of the federal poverty level. Other intersection in what I was talking about with the availability of services in, in rural America, certainly the growth in the community health center program uh, is affecting the availability of safety net services in rural places. 
workforce expansion that was in Title V of the ACA that doesn't get a lot of play uh, has been very important to rural America meeting some of the workforce needs through National Health Service Corps, new nursing training programs, and others. And availability of services that we're seeing through changes in the delivery system. There are questions we need to be asking as the marketplaces develop in rural places or in states. Uh, what do some of the rural residents really need to help gain access? It says dollars and cents because they need help with affordability of coverage. They also need help with deciding how to take advantage of new provisions related to affordability of coverage. What might be different about the challenges in rural as compared to urban, the marketplaces are certainly different and how do policy choices affect what's available to rural residents. From some of the research, and these are in the documents that you have that we're doing as well as others, uh, this is what it looks like in the exchanges. There are state-based exchanges. The slide says 17 states. Technically, that's 16 states in the District of Columbia. Partnerships between federally facilitated and states in seven and 27 that are using the federally facilitated exchanges. For rural America, we're looking at some characteristics about how the market functions in these new models, the governance uh, of those exchanges, support for enrollment activities, how that transpires in rural places, uh, access to, stand to uh, services, and how we certify the qualified plans. Shifting to the characteristics of the uninsured and, and who might benefit, another document that's in your packet that uh, we just released earlier this week. Uh, a larger portion of the rural population, especially the uninsured, would be eligible for some of the expansions, whether it's Medicaid expansion or the new subsidies, than in urban counties. So let me repeat that. That's the general conclusion of, all, of both of those bullets. A larger proportion of the rural uninsured are in households that will become eligible for either the subsidies or Medicaid expansion, assuming for the moment that over the next period of time Medicaid expansion becomes available to all of them. What we're doing to invest in rural health services on the availability side, the community health center fund that was created in the ACA has affected access to care in rural places, the workforce grants through the Health Profession Opportunity Grant Program and the $229 million of new expansion money in the National Health Service Corps. In system change in rural places, I'll focus on the key example, which is a, accountable care organizations. These are new uh, organizations set up by the ACA in the Medicare program uh, whose intention is to, over a three-year period, generate cost savings while maintaining a standard of quality that's set fairly high, and then those cost savings are shared between the Medicare program and the providers. We didn't know how rapidly this might catch on and how much of it would end up in rural America. Uh, the numbers are higher, I think, than any of us expected coming in. Uh, as of a few weeks ago, there were 32 what are called pioneer ACOs. These are more mature organizations that uh, bear risk across different payer types. There are now 23. Within the last month, nine decided they, they really needed to pull out of the program. Point, though, is there are 23 now pioneer ACOs. Uh, 220 Medicare Shared Savings Program ACOs, 32 of which are called advanced payment. They're getting special payments ahead of time that get repaid out of savings so they can invest in setting up their ACOs. And there are more than 400 ACOs total, public uh, and private. They are in rural places in every census region of the country. There are 79 that are in both metropolitan and non-metropolitan. They operate in over 17% of the counties, and there are nine that are exclusively in rural places. Very quickly, this is the color version of the map that, that's also in your packet that shows the distribution across the country. I'll close on a little bit of microcosm of what's happening in my own state uh, in Iowa as an example of the activity both market-based and ACA-based. Uh, Iowa is one of the states that is a federally facilitated exchange, but is a state partnership model for that exchange. And we're proceeding in, in our state with developing a lot of materials for consumers. 
uh, a public policy institute at, at my university is participating by generating survey data to see what is it consumers want to know about, how would they like the message delivered to them, what are some of the key words and phrases that resonate with consumers. So there's a lot of progress being made on how to reach out, especially as we get close to October 1 and enrollment uh, time. There are two statewide carriers in Iowa that will offer plans in the new exchange. One of those carriers is actually one of the handful of state co-ops around the country. Our approach to expansion is expand the Medicaid eligibility to 100% and then use Medicaid dollars to help purchase plans through exchanges between 100% and 138% of the federal poverty level. We have a priority for workforce development and dispersion across the state, new state spending in that regard, as well as new university-based programs. And we're moving toward integrated systems, including accountable care organizations as the methodology being used in the expansion of the Medicaid program. So thank you for your attention, and I'll shift it over to Tom. Okay. Uh, can I just ask, uh, before we turn to Tom, Keith, you talked about the sort of bifurcated expansion with Medicaid covering those under 100% and mm -hmm. private insurance over that uh, 138. Uh, has that been approved by HHS? No, I think the application is just about ready to go in. Uh, and, and to clarify a, a little bit, Ed, the, the 100 to 138 is still considered to be part of the Medicaid program, but what they're doing instead of having those individuals and households get their benefits directly from Medicaid, they're using the Medicaid dollars, both state and federal, to help them purchase a plan so it's of no cost to them to buy one of the plans in the marketplace. Very good. Thank you. Uh, and as, as Keith said, we turn next to Tom Morris. He's the head of the Office of Rural Health Policy within HHS's Health Resources and Services Administration, HRSA. Uh, he served as HRSA's Associate Administrator for Rural Health Policy for the last five years. Tom, I didn't get a chance to say hello before the, before the program began. Hello. <laughs> and thank you very much for being with us. And th thank you so much for the opportunity to be here. Um, a little bit about uh, our office and what we do. We are located in the Health Resources and Services Administration, but our office actually has a department-wide charge to coordinate rural activities within HHS. And as part of that, a uh, big part of what we do is, is keep our eye on, on the policies and their impact on rural communities. And we do that through uh, uh, both our analysis, but also working with a, a series of research centers, including Keith at the University of Iowa. We have a number of grant programs, I think, that focus very heavily on capacity building, both at the state level um, and at the community level. And then we've, we're very, very much focused on technical assistance to rural communities uh, to help them sort of navigate what is becoming an increasingly complex healthcare environment. A little bit about our policy work. Um, we basically review all the Medicare and Medicaid and the ACA regulations that come through the department each year. Um, that's hundreds and hundreds of pages of regulations, all with an eye towards how does this affect access in rural communities. And so that's sort of how we take our charge in the sense that we try to at least raise those issues that would be a concern. We try to make sure there's a level playing field. In other words, policy should be predicated on that which, which, which affects everybody equally, not focused solely on the largest areas of our country, big metro areas, but something that takes into account all the unique circumstances that every community faces. Um, Obviously, we also focus on other regulations that come through. We've, we've had a uh, uh, looking at the meaningful use regulations around electronic health records. And then quality has been an increasing area of focus for us because as we measure quality, we want to make sure that we're measuring those things that are as relevant in a rural care setting as they would be, say, here in Washington, D.C. We, we could not do this work without the support of our research centers who provide a lot of the analysis and the data that help support those points. Um, and then we also work with a group out of Oklahoma, Oklahoma State University, that looks at the in intersection of health care and economic development in rural communities. Typically in a rural area, a hospital will be the number two or number three employer. And so uh, it takes on a bigger impact as a result of that if a hospital closes or if it expands its services. All those things have, have a bigger implication in a rural community than they would, say, in a suburban area. In terms of um, our policy role, we're also staffing the Secretary's National Advisory Committee on Rural Health and Human Services. Just as my office has the charge to advise HHS internally, the committee, which is chaired by former Mississippi Governor Ronnie Musgrove, 
and includes healthcare and human service experts from around the country. Their charge is to do the same thing but externally. And for the last few years, they've been focused very heavily on the impact of the ACA on rural communities. So they produced a series of briefs that look at different provisions within the ACA, uh, all with an eye idea, the notion of perhaps on the front end, advising the department on things they ought to take into account before they begin rulemaking. Um, and then one of the briefs I would draw your attention to, all of which are up on the web right now, is one they did last year, some of the deficit reduction proposals that were being proposed either by the Congress or by the administration, looked at some changes to uh, uh, rural hospital designations and specifically critical access hospitals. And so the committee, I think, did a nice job of sort of looking at the impact of what those policy changes might mean for those hospitals and for the communities they serve. Now, I think anytime you talk about rural communities, and I think Ed alluded to it in his introduction, is you have to sort of realize that rural is not a smaller version of urban or a smaller version of suburban. It has unique characteristics, some of which I think Ed cited very nicely. Uh, and I'd like to just add a little bit to that. In addition to the fact that folks are older and sicker, there's a higher mortality rate in rural communities. You have a different provider mix and a different service mix. You're very much focused on primary care and chronic disease management, and you may not have access to the specialty care that you would have in an urban area. Also, access to the full range of post-acute care services may not be the same in a rural community uh, as it is in a suburban or an urban community. And they're much more dependent on public payers. We have hospitals in which their payer mix, uh, when you look at Medicare and Medicaid, make up 70 to 80 percent of their total pay. And so what that means is that any sort of change we make in policy at either the Medicare or Medicaid level tends to have a disproportionate impact on rural providers because of that dependency. And I raise all this mostly just to make the point that when you think about policy solutions as healthcare is changing so rapidly, you have to do so thinking about the diversity of the infrastructure and the delivery system that's out there. In other words, just because it worked in an urban or suburban area doesn't mean it can be downsized and work just as well in a rural area. Now, I know the focus of this meeting is on access and workforce, and so there are a number of things that we're doing around access, and I think Keith's data um, really points up the opportunity that rural communities have under the Affordable Care Act and the insurance expansion. And the data he cited is very similar to the data we have in the department um, that looks at the fact that per, on a per-person basis, uh, we'll, we have the potential for more rural folks to benefit from this expansion than their urban counterparts. But the other thing I guess I would say is that the next couple months really are critical in terms of getting the word out. So we're putting a big push on the department in terms of making sure people are aware of the law. We're driving them towards healthcare.gov, the newly revamped website. And then we're, we're, we're putting uh, information out there and also funding to help the navigators to, to work enrolling people in the insurance options come October 1. We also put some funding out into the community health centers to help them with that sort of enrollment. And there'll be a six-month enrollment period in which people will be able to sign up for these plans. And so reaching out to rural communities may take a little bit of a different effort than, say, reaching a suburban, suburban or an urban area. And that's why I think one of the approaches we're taking as a department is to make sure that you can submit an application by paper just as easily as you could online. Not every rural area has the same access to internet connectivity that urban and suburban areas have. But once you have insurance, of course, then you need the providers out there to do it. And Keith had already mentioned community health centers, the important role that they play. We know there are about 8,000 community health service center sites around the country. About 40% of them uh, are either located in or serve rural communities, rural health clinics. Uh, there's about 4,000 Medicare-certified rural health clinics around the country. They also play an important safety net role and are key access points for primary care. Through a grant program in our office, the Rural Health Outreach Program, we test out new ideas and pilot programs to either improve access to or the coordination of care in rural communities, hoping we can then replicate them in other areas. We also do a lot of work with rural hospitals through our Rural Hospital Flexibility Program and Small Hospital Improvement Program, all with an eye towards improving their financial viability and their quality so that they can continue to thrive and be access points in their rural communities. And then the final area I guess I'd mention would be our telehealth work, where we put grants out to help uh, support test beds for finding out how we can use telehealth technology to increase access to care for, say, a specialist in an urban area being able to treat a patient in, an er in a rural area. Now, in terms of workforce, we have a number of tools uh, that are worth noting. One of the things we've really focused on of late is trying to do more training in community-based and rural settings. And the best example of that are the rural training tracks. 
we find that of the 23 rural training tracks now in place, about 70% of the graduates of those residency programs stay in rural areas. So we're trying to expand the number of those. We have about five new programs that are gonna come on this year, and we hope to get that same number again next year. Our Teaching Health Center program in HRSA is another example of trying to get some of the physician training out of the academic health center and into community-based settings to prepare people better for the reality of what they're gonna be seeing when they're actually in practice. Uh, the National Service Corps was mentioned, about 50% of the placements in the National Service Corps go to rural communities. There are other programs such as the State Conrad 30 which allow foreign trained physicians to, to uh, stay in rural areas if they agree to practice for three years. So all these programs are part of the safety net to get workers, healthcare workers, out into rural communities. The other thing that has uh, been a, a, a really a wonderful opportunity over the last couple of years has been the creation of the White House Rural Council. This was created by uh, an executive order by the president in 2011, and the charge was fairly straightforward, how to, how to better coordinate all the federal agencies that serve rural communities. And so we've been front and center in a lot of those activities, and we have also focused a lot on jobs and economic development. And as I mentioned, healthcare is a major employer in rural areas, so healthcare has been front and center in what we do in that regard. So we've expanded the National Service Corps to critical access hospitals. We've also looked at trying to train more workers in health information technology, as that's a growth field nationally, but particularly in rural communities. And we think that rural serving community colleges can play a key role in educating that next workforce. We've also looked at ways we can make it easier for the providers that are out there to practice to the full scope of their training. And so this past year, we introduced a regulatory burden reduction proposed rule that looked at specifically at ways that nurse practitioners and physician assistants could do more in the settings they're in and have a lighter regulatory burden as a result of that. And I think all of this is done with an eye towards uh, you know, the, the period we're facing right now, which is healthcare is changing dramatically. Uh, we're seeing a lot of consolidation going on in the industry. Uh, we're seeing an increased focus, appropriately so, on quality. And we're also seeing an increased focus on trying to manage costs better. And one of the challenges, of course, is what does this mean for rural providers? And so as we think about all of our programs in the Office of Rural Policy, whether it's our grants work, our uh, technical assistance work, or even how we review our policy and regulations, what can we do to make sure that we're helping rural providers survive this transition, and not only survive it, but also thrive in an environment in which we're gonna be more focused on value and less focused on volume. And so this slide is just an illustration of that, and it'll be part of what we're doing over the next couple of years. So Ed, thank you so much for the opportunity to be here. Thank you so much, Tom. Uh, we can move this at the other end. Pass that down. Uh, we're going to turn next to uh, Dr. Art Kaufman. He's the Vice Chancellor for Community Health at the University of New Mexico Health Sciences Center. He's both an internist and a family doc. Uh, and the list of innovative programs that he's put together at the university is as long as LeBron James's arms, I think. Uh, one of those innovative projects is the development of health extension rural offices, and we've asked him to tell us a little bit about those offices today, among other things. Dr. Kaufman, thanks so much for joining us. Thanks so much, Ed. Well, uh, I wanted to talk to you about two programs you probably don't know much about, but we think are very important. Both of them are the, in the Affordable Care Act, They're buried in there, Section 5405. Uh, but actually we've uh, brought these up and they've had a very powerful impact on our state and we think this has implications for rural health across the country as well as in urban areas. But we think that they uh, are addressing big challenges we have, especially in academic health centers. And those challenges are that almost all the training and role modeling are in big centers in big cities. And uh, when you look at the health team, it's far too narrow to address the kinds of problems faced in rural uh, America. And then when you look at the impact of our health system, we're shocked to find it only has an impact maybe on 10 or 15 percent of what makes communities healthy. We are just missing the boat. And that's why with all the money we spend in health care delivery in the United States, it has such a little impact uh, commensurate or not commensurate with the amount we're spending. So uh, we decided to have a radically different uh, vision for our all, whole health science center to address the rural and urban health crisis we face in our state. And we came up with this challenging and, as you can see, competitive uh, um, vision. And it's with uh, our academic health center, we'll work with community partners to help New Mexico make more progress in health and health equity than any other state by 2020. 
The challenge is out there. Our chancellor is terrified. We've only got seven more years. Are we making progress? You can imagine. Um, so I have to answer this every day. And uh, what's interesting is the operative word health. It's not just health services. It's all those things that underlie health. And some of the biggest things that underlie health are not really the lack of doctors and nurses or the presence of them or pharmacists or OTs or PTs. It's the social determinants, adequate housing, access to food. We're just talking about food deserts, um, stress, um, exclusion, social exclusion, educational attainment, transportation. All of those things have a huge impact on health. And I'm going to give you an example. In New Mexico, if you look at deaths from diabetes in our state, the Native American population has the best screening and treatment for diabetes of all ethnic populations in our state. And yet, they have the worst health outcomes, the highest death rate from this disease. Why? It's not because the screening and treatment is bad. It's because it comes too late. It can't make up for the fact of decades of poor nutrition, high stress, um, very low educational attainment, poverty, all of those social determinants. So if we're going to make an impact on our state, and this is true of every state, how is all the money poured into the health system going to be shared with those who actually impact social determinants? So we looked around and we found one of the best models is in the Agricultural Extension Service. Now it's a different sector. Now we're talking about agriculture, but we're in health. But when we look at agriculture, these cooperative extension agents, they deal with economic development. They make sure farmers have greater crop yields. They help their youth graduate from school, do better through their 4-H clubs. They help proper canning for safety. They help improve nutrition through lots of nutrition classes. So we decided we're going to copy them, steal their name, and run off and have health extension coordinators. And now we have them all over our state. And their primary role is to link the community's health priorities with the health science center's resources. Move the locus of control out of the health science center towards the community. It's been very successful. They not only help make those programs respond to community's priorities, but they monitor what's happening. And now we have these in different parts of the state. And they'll do all kinds of things. For example, uh, they help with uh, reducing uh, opioid treatments. They um, find that one of the biggest problems in rural New Mexico, besides primary care, are dental problems and especially behavioral health problems. If you're in a small town and you have a behavioral health problem, are you going to go to your local behavioral health provider with a sign and everyone drives by and says, whose car is that? So the problems of access are huge. So they've been training all over the state lots of uh, lay uh, first responders, lay people in med uh, mental health first aid. It's another response. They've set up telepharmacy to keep pharmacies going. They do a lot of work in trying to get kids to stay in school, graduate, and go into health careers. If you look at none of the number one employer in some of our rural communities, it's the health system. In Taos County, 65% of the new jobs were in health. And if you can get a doc to go to a rural town, they hire 18 people directly and indirectly. They generate a million dollars in business. So it is a huge economic driver, a big social determinant, just like educational attainment. The success of this has led us to develop health hubs, academic extension hubs, where it's not just the provider, it's also linking with community colleges, federally qualified health centers, local hospitals, civic organizations, where now we have uh, memorandums of agreement going out with all of those. And when you have a hub like that, it's attractive to health professionals to be recruited and to stay because they have professional and social bonds reducing isolation. So that success has been enormous. Then to track what is the outcome. We often spend a lot of time training and when people finish our training in nursing and pharmacy and medicine, OTPT, say goodbye, have a great life. It's not good enough. We want to know where they're going and whether they're meeting state needs. So we track in every single county for a population of, let's say, 56,000, how many docs, nurses, pharmacists should there be compared to what they have? For that gap, are we responding? Are we connecting with all the other training programs in the state? So we're beginning to develop that response. And that's been powerful. And then we want to know 
how do we actually measure ourselves against other states? And this is just an example. You could look at something like primary care providers per 100,000 population. And in New Mexico back in 2010, we were like 113.6. Well, if we want to jump three states worth, we've got to hire, we've got to train and deploy 50 other primary care docs. It's quantitative, a social determinant, educational attainment, and high school graduation rate. We're one of the poorest in the country. We would have to train 1,500 more, train, graduate 1,500 more kids from high school to jump three states worth. So we're making it very quantitative so everyone can see like on a temperature chart whether we're getting closer and closer. Now, the one new, kind of newer, uh, growing part of our health team that does most with social determinants are community health workers. And what was interesting about this is all of our health extension coordinators train community health workers and it's in the Affordable Care Act. And what we're finding is managed care has bought these up. We, they pay us to train and deploy them and they're decreasing substantially hospitalizations, ER visits, uh, unbridled use of medications because they're doing a lot of personal training uh, about how to use the system better and addressing social determinants like transportation and other issues. So that is a growing concern. And finally, what is most interesting to make the circle come back together again, instead of just stealing Cooperative Extension's name, running away and uh, putting it in health, we're actually now working with Cooperative Extension. And I was interested in the former panelists talking about the need for outreach and informing populations about how important it is to get insurance, whether it's Medicaid or subsidized through the exchange. As it turns out, we just got the state's grant to do that work with Cooperative Extension. They're in every county, we're in every county, and together we're sending messages out. It's not just for the new people who are now going to become eligible because of the Affordable Care Act. It's because 30% of the current uninsured people in our state who are eligible for Medicaid are not on Medicaid. There are so many barriers that we have to work with that population as well. And then in our primary care clinics that are so desperate to have, for their chronic disease patients, to have, for example, nutrition education. Cooperative Extension is now helping our primary care clinics nutrition classes, they're helping them grow food, we got bees going, the aviers, they're, they're selling all kinds of products, they're doing economic development around the primary care clinics, mostly federally qualified health centers. So I think there's a model that's developing that we would love to share. Thank you. Thanks very much, Art. By the way, what are OLAS that were listed under economic development? The Spanish word, oh yeah. So what they are, are uh, you can see them, it's the, it's the one with the tag on it. They're kind of uh, clay pots and they're porous. It's an ancient kind of irrigation. It has a very narrow neck. You stick it in the ground, put water in it so it's, the neck is so narrow it doesn't evaporate. But it irrigates about a, a foot around and that's how you grow little plants. All Ten right, dollars in oil. <laughs> <laughs> Great, thanks very much. Uh, our final speaker is Lisa Miller. Uh, she's a senior program officer for the Bingham Program, which is a foundation in the state of Maine. She's also a former multi-term member of the Maine legislature, where she was a member of both health and spending committees. And if you've ever listened to the Alliance's former honorary co-chairman, Senator Susan Collins, talk about rural health issues, you'd know how rural Maine really is. So we're very pleased that you were able to join us today, Lisa. Thank you very much, Ed. Uh, I hope you can see me way back there. If I stand up, it won't make any difference. <laughs> um, I, I've been brought here, I think, to, to be a little bit more on the ground about how uh, expansion of coverage meets workforce constraints in a small rural state. Um, let me give you a quickie little background on Maine. Um, the census has recently said that we are the um, third most rural state in the country. We are now the oldest state in the country, and I live in the oldest county in the oldest state in the country. Um, we have been fairly low income for a number of years. We have moved, clawing our way up from about 35th in uh, 
personal income to about 28th now. Um, the, these are not all great components that are going to uh, predict good health outcomes, but actually, uh, according to the United Health Foundation in their state rankings, Maine is ranked number nine as the healthiest state. Um, and if you're familiar with those health rankings, you know, there's like, there's 20, 24 components to those. You know that your penetration of primary care is one of the factors, and your rate of uninsured is one of the factors. And Maine is very good on both of those, along with its low violence rate, its high immunization rates, et cetera. But, but the, the health of our, of our health care system is an important factor in the health of our state as well. Um, in fact, our health care sector is uh, the largest in the nation, and that is um, health sector employment as a percentage of statewide employment. Whoa, little Maine, why would that be? Well, when you look at the graph of other states, you see the other states clustering up there with us are Vermont, New Hampshire, West Virginia, all small rural states, all significantly aging populations. We seem to need bigger healthcare systems for that kind of state. We join our other state colleagues in New England as having a very high penetration of primary care in that, in that healthcare services system. Um, Maine has 1.5 primary care physicians per thousand population. The U.S. is 1.2. Um, that sounds great, but in any one time, uh, any snapshot you take in terms of recruitment, and I used to recruit physicians uh, for rural health centers, um, we're, we're looking for 100 primary care docs just about all the time. By the way, my materials at the back on the right-hand side of your packet, I opted not to be very techy in terms of uh, throwing up slides at you. Um, so how, how does this pretty good pretty good primary care system meet up with expanded health care coverage. Well, you may not know that Maine used to, um, until very recently, have extraordinarily good Medicaid coverage. We had parents covered up to 150 percent. We covered 19 and 20 year olds. We had <coughs> Medicare savings plan coverage. We had lots of small population groups tucked into uh, Medicaid when the opportunities arose. Um, and with that very generous, very somewhat rich Medicaid coverage system, we did not experience crises and emergency issues around, do we have enough workforce to deal with that? Um, so we're not quite as worried about what the ACA and its expansion is going to mean in our little rural state. Now, since that time in 2010 when we hit our peak in Medicaid coverage, it has been rolled back. We have a very conservative governor. We, have, we did have um, a Republican s Senate and House a few years ago, and they rolled back Medicaid a fair amount. We will not be a Medicaid expansion state. Our current Senate and House, which is Democrat, passed Medicaid expansion. The governor vetoed it. We were not able to override the veto. So we will not be joining others in Medicaid expansion just yet. Um, we will be watching. New Hampshire, very carefully. Maine seems to like to follow New Hampshire. New Hampshire is doing yet another legislative study. Any of you, you all know, you're, you're pretty much policy geeks. You know legislative studies are the fallback when you can't get anything passed. Um, New Hampshire is studying the impact of Medicaid expansion on their state. And Maine is watching, I think, somewhat carefully. Um, what, uh, what do we have in place in terms of uh, pr production of primary care clinicians and how are they distributing around the state? Um, we have had a, an osteopathic medical school for 35 years and if you're at all familiar with osteopathic medical schools, they train primarily primary care docs or have historically. 60% uh, of the graduates from the University of New England in Maine are primary care physicians. Um, 25% of our rural docs are graduates from UNE. So um, that is a, a very important resource to us. And they're going to be virtually doubling their class by 2015. That's good for our workforce. We have started a new allopathic uh, 
program. We've never had an MD training program in Maine. It's a collaboration between Tufts Medical School and, and one of our large hospitals. Um, I work for a foundation. We've been pumping some money into that program. It is targeted at primary care. It is targeted at rural experiences uh, in, in rural health centers and residencies in rural areas to get these young people hooked on rural practice. Um, we've, we've had a physician, uh, a, P, a PA program in Maine for about, uh, I think, 20 plus years. Uh, we crank out 45 of those graduates. They will be expanding that program with funds from the ACA. Uh, we have five advanced practice nurse training programs. And they've hit a wall in terms of any expansions. And those of you who know about training, health professions training know, the nurses are having a hard time finding enough faculty uh, in all of their training programs. So they're, they're tweaking what they can. They're aiming at being more gerontology oriented, which is a good thing for an aging state like ours. Um, I, I would like to opine a little bit about will PAs and nurse practitioners solve our primary care problem? And I really don't think they will in Maine. We are seeing, over these years of all the training we've done at PAs and nurse practitioners, they are clustering in group practices. They are going to suburban and urban practices, just like other clinicians. They go where there's good opportunities, good salaries, collegial uh, surroundings. Um, we're, I just called our uh, main board of nursing the other day and asked, how many nurse practitioners have set up a shingle by themselves out in a rural area? Maybe five. And that is with one of the most liberal nurse practice acts in the country. Uh, we're one of the top 14 states. So even if you liberalize your practice acts, that is not going to be sending, I think, you know, waves of clinicians out to rural areas. There's more to it than that. Um, so what, what other things are we doing to shore up primary care in Maine? We are great grant writers. We always have been. We have um, jumped on whatever foundation and federal monies we can get. We have a very healthy uh, patient-centered medical home system in Maine, 100 practices. Um, we are aiming towards 80 uh, health home practices, behavioral health home practices funded through Medicaid and the ACA. We've got 14 of our health centers in a payment reform uh, grant from CMS. And ironically, our state, which is not, has not opted to set up its own exchange, has not opted to expand Medicaid, lo and behold, did opt to get a $33 million uh, award for state innovation models from uh, CMS. And it has many moving parts in it, but it, some important moving parts will be shoring up primary care uh, and tinkering with payment reform systems. Um, and then lastly, I didn't throw it on the sheet, but another important part that, uh, of what's shoring up our systems in Maine uh, is that hospitals are buying up primary care practices right and left. About 70 to 75% of our clinicians are owned by hospitals now. Uh, and that is most of primary, most of primary care. The, the thing that I worry about with that is that rural health centers, FQHCs, are not being bought up, and their salaries are much lower than the hospital-based uh, clinicians. And how are we going to keep recruiting primary care docs and, and middle, uh, middle clinicians like PAs and nurse practitioners when our salaries are so very different? Um, so to me, the ultimate access tool that will improve access in rural areas is payment reform. A tectonic change in reimbursement, uh, mostly between primary care and specialty practices. Thank you. That's terrific. Thank you so much, Lisa. Um, a very impressive list of, of accomplishments in the state, and yet a lot of challenges remaining. Now we get to the point where we're asking you to be part of the dialogue. I also encourage uh, any of our panelists who have either a question for one of their fellow panelists or a comment on something that they've heard 
to uh, signal that, and we'll try to get to that fairly, fairly quickly. We have microphones. If you do want to ask a question uh, in your own voice, go to the microphone, identify yourself if you would, and uh, keep the question as brief as you possibly can so we can explore as many of these issues as we can. Uh, Zane, let me just uh, reiterate my encouragement that you uh, chime in with questions and comments at any point. Um, and of course, if you have a, a question you want to write down on the green card in your packet, that's fine too, and we'll have it brought forward. Uh, let me start off by uh, kind of tying together some of the things that we've heard uh, from several of our panelists, and, and uh, it, it was triggered in my mind first when I looked at Keith Mueller's map of where the ACO spread is in this country. And although you make the point that there are, so what, 17 percent of the rural counties have some sort of ACO presence, okay, six out of seven do not, and there look like an awful lot of ACO deserts in what look like some of the rural states. Uh, and if payment reform is part of the answer and ACOs are one of the ways we're moving away from fee-for-service, is it important to try to get ACOs to move more aggressively into some of these areas that we're concerned about? And if so, how do we do that? Great question. It, <clears throat> excuse me. It is important to get payment reform and the move toward pay for value being a higher percentage of total reward than simply pay for volume. I think that general movement is critical and needs to occur almost everywhere. You know, if you look at that map, there are places in northern Montana, places in Wyoming where no, because it's just you don't have the volume to make anything else work other than sustaining the, the fee-for-service environment that's there. But it may not always be the ACO shared savings model. There are some other models being demonstrated under the innovation grants from CMMI, other models being tried by major insurance carriers, like in our state, Wellmark. Uh, they all have that theme, though, of trying to do two things. One, set up a payment system that rewards high value and moves providers to even higher levels of value. And second, sets up payment systems in which providers benefit from lowering the total cost of care. And in fact, in some places now, it's being called a total cost of care approach to how you pay providers. Mm -hmm. Okay. Anybody else? Yes, go ahead. Uh, thanks. Uh, Bob Rohr, BMJ. Uh, two questions for you. First of all, how does the, how do health outcomes, how does the, you know, the life expectancy, et cetera, of rural versus urban populations differ? I mean, we've heard, you know, let's face it, we're, we're interested in outcomes. Mm -hmm. So what's the baseline difference between the two populations in terms of their health, overall health? There have been some studies in the last year looking at mortality and it being uh, uh, low, you know, people die younger in rural than they do in urban areas. And a new study they just released in the last couple of weeks from the University of uh, Pennsylvania looked at what, what drives death rates, rural versus urban. And the findings were interesting. Yeah, you're, you know, in urban you're more likely to die of a, um, you know, in terms of a violent act, but uh, rural has a higher accident rate and then that relates to the infrastructure for emergency care and things like that. Some of the statistics Ed cited about, you know, higher rate of chronic disease obviously leads to some of that lower mortality rate in, in rural areas. So there are some studies out there. Um, how that factors into outcomes, I think that's, that's sort of the alchemy people are trying to figure out what, what measures are strong enough and relevant enough across the spectrum that you could potentially tie them to uh, physician reimbursement or hospital reimbursement. We're just taking the initial steps there with value-based purchasing and the value-based modifier, but you know, it's, it's not something you can just sort of turn a switch on and do right away, but it's, it, it is the point of emphasis, I think, moving forward. Sort of a, a central report on the kind of population data that you're talking about was released by the Center for Disease Control and Prevention about, I think it's eight to ten years ago now. Uh, I know that the University of South Carolina's research center is working on an update of that, but it's not out yet. 
Well, what about incidence of chronic conditions between the two populations? How do those differ? Higher in rural than in urban for almost all of them. Uh, you know, there's about Diab a half a dozen that, that people tend to look at. Diabetes, congestive heart failure, AMI. Um, you also have higher rates of activities of daily living, limitations on rural populations, so recovery from stroke, things like that, all part of that spectrum. Does that differ significantly by region of the country? I think so. Yes. Um, certainly, I think, I think you'll see a different <coughs> gradient in the southeast than you would say in uh, Maine. What you think are um, and you, th that so correlates a lot of times with what you see with the Dartmouth Health Rankings, mm -hmm. too. And, and the regional variation is both urban and rural. Um, finally, in, in talking about poverty and the definition of, of that, does that, is that just based upon cash income? Uh, what I'm thinking of is, is uh, rural populations can often subsidize lack of income with growing their own food, things like this, which are opportunities urban populations often do not have. I believe it is household income. Uh, and I don't think that the federal the poverty level calculations include assets. No, no. All right, yes, at the yeah. rear of the room. Right, uh, my name is Jim Slattery. I'm a partner at a law firm here in Washington, Wiley Ryan. I, I'm just curious how the panelists view how the enrollment process is going to work in rural America. Rural America is represented today by a lot of political leadership, both at the state and national level, that are really hostile to the implementation of the Affordable Care Act. So you have about 35 states out there that are so hostile that they refuse to set up their own state exchanges. So HHS is going to have to come in and set up a state exchange, operate an FFE in those states. I'm curious how you all see this enrollment process unfolding in those FFE states, especially given the just blatant political hostility at the state and local level? Uh, we have a re related question, actually, that just came in on a card, w wondering the, whether, given the fact that there are so many federally operated exchanges in rural states, uh, how well equipped the feds are going to be to adapt to the local needs that are sometimes a little different in rural communities. Yes, um, Lisa. We were musing about this last night at dinner, and uh, I think certainly in Maine, um, the more that we can start calling these products something else besides Obamacare, the ACA, or whatever, um, you know, Maine named products, the better off we're going to be because you know the, the polls say when you talk to people about uh, what these insurance products will look like and some of the benefits of the ACA, they're all for them. So, you know, sort of politically separating the names from it. Secondly, um, this, I, I work for philanthropy and uh, the philanthropic world is uh, particularly the conversion foundations, foundations that were created by the sale of anthems, blue crosses, blue shields, big hospital systems, whatever, whose, whose mission is access to health care. You are going to be finding in states with very healthy uh, conversion foundation philanthropies, they are pouring a lot of money into uh, enrollment strategies uh, with both public and private sectors. Um, and I think that is a factor that none of us really counted on before when we were thinking about the gearing up of, of this system. One of, the, one of the things that I would just also ask you about is, in the last couple of days, the department has issued their regulations and their agreements, really proposed agreements, with web brokers. And what role do you all see web brokers playing in this process? Because many of these web brokers have, are licensed as agent brokers in the states and therefore avoiding conf conflicts and issues about navigators and whether navigators need to be licensed as agents and brokers in, again, these states that are hostile to the implementation. What role do you all see web brokers playing in this enrollment process, and why hasn't this been talked about more at the state level? 
no brokers. I can speak from New Mexico. Um, the, uh, the current brokers are not allowed to uh, serve as navigators. Uh, uh, they have to be trained separately. They can't have uh, the kinds of relationships they've had with um, insurance companies. They have to be neutral. The problem we have is that you can have as many navigators as you want. Each time a navigator, like a PE MOSO worker, uh, spends hours with an individual to try to get them either on the exchange or in Medicaid, uh, that doesn't deal with the fact that 80% of the population in New Mexico who's uninsured doesn't know about what the availability is. And it's partly what you said about the hostility of the political climate that has so tainted this. But there are other ways, like you've heard of suppression of votes, there's also suppression of getting people enrolled. There are so many barriers to someone becoming enrolled, whether it's stigma or distance in a rural area, or, uh, oh, they lost their application, or uh, we didn't hire enough people in uh, the Medicaid office to handle it. You're just going to have to wait. There are so many ways that even a state that has accepted Medicaid can slow the process. With many people having a, a view of Medicaid, is it's, it's a handout. It's just making people dependent. So I think that is the hugest problem we are actually now facing in our state, which has accepted Medicaid. OK. Yes, can you? Hi, sorry. <laughs> just a second. Um, my name is Sandra Wilkins. I work for Senator Heinrich from New Mexico. And um, yay, <laughs> go New Mexico. My question is actually directed to you and others as well. But I'm very interested in this issue of social determinants of health. Um, and intervening early, uh, and as we think about health delivery systems and reforms that are on their path or coming, um, are we addressing that level of intervention? And if not, what should we do, be doing federally? And I guess a follow-up to that is, does anyone know if any innovation center ideas are being put out there to address this more broadly? So I'll start. The, um, if you were to make one intervention that would have a bigger impact on health than anything else, it would get more kids graduating from school. The problem is it's a different uh, system. So the health system uses its money for its own. We have to figure out a way to cross sectors of the community. One of the ways of doing it is, for example, pipeline into health careers. My feeling is it's great if they want to become a nurse. But it's even more important that they graduate from school. So we have to use the resources available to understand the impact on health of these other social determinants. We're setting up food pantries all around the state in food deserts, which are heavily in our rural areas. I think we're the third highest food insecure state because it's a health issue. You know, I, in, in a hospital, I'm doing drips for all kinds of lip, intralipids, but then there are people without food out there. There's a disconnect between how I'm being paid and what communities need. So I think in every one of these major social determinants, the health system has to be incented to going out and doing something about it. And that's where these bridge people, like community health workers, are so important. They're bringing this reality into the front line of our clinics and hospitals, and it has to be ramped up. I'll jump in really quick, since they're over here buzzing. Um, <laughs> another thing we're doing in Maine, and, and again, I work for a philanthropy that is very interested in primary prevention. We're a health philanthropy. We started looking into how do you prevent domestic violence. What you really do is step many steps back and look at the field of early childhood experiences, adverse childhood experiences, and how predictive it is that if you've been, as a child, exposed to a, a drunken adult, child abuse, domestic abuse, um, loss of a, of a parent, et cetera, et cetera, extreme poverty, the tracking of your chronic disease, not even to speak of all the social problems you may experience and the drug abuse you may experience, is dramatic. So we are now, in our state, we have a very large effort at looking at early childhood intervention, trying to alert helping professionals across education and health sectors to be looking for these adverse childhood experiences and intervening around them because they have huge health implications and chronic disease implications later in life. Anybody else? Just a, a couple of quick examples, because you asked where, where could you find some things. Uh, the Public Health Trust Fund that was in Title IV of the ACA has been funding some community transition grants around the country. So if you look up through a search engine community transition grants, you'll find examples. 
Some of the innovation grants that are funded out of the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Innovation include addressing the social determinants of health, and there's a large program that the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation Fund has been supporting uh, in public health. So if you've got any of those sites, you can pull down some specific examples. I might add one thing to that, and that is the uh, community transformation grants that Keith mentioned had a 20% rural set-aside in it. First time in my 16 years here, 17 years here, that in a big public health grant there was a rural set-aside. And I think it was a recognition of the fact that if you just, when you block grant those things to the state, it tends to be where can you get the biggest impact for the, for the number? Uh, and that often is in the urban and suburban areas. So the fact that they explicitly said 20% of those funds need to go to rural communities was, I think, an acknowledgement and a possible path forward for how to address the fact that the disease states are worse in rural communities and earmarking money for that and, and acknowledging it on the front end uh, in order to change those outcomes. Good. Zane, you've been sifting through a bunch of green cards. Uh, what have you come up with? You know, in speaking with uh, Lisa and uh, questions that come up in the, the type of delivery that's best done locally with the federally qualified health centers, there's a question asking, you mentioned the expression of FQHCs as a part of increasing access to care in rural areas. As you know, the CHC expansion has not been as robust as planned in ACA due to a cut in the uh, discretionary funding in 2011, causing the CAC fund to backfill uh, for the cut. If the expansion of CHCs had gone through as intended, what would the impact have been in rural areas? And I think both you discussed that as well as Tom, you were talking about the funding mechanisms, if both could uh, address that. Well, I think it's, it's hard to predict for dollars that aren't there, you know, because they're competitive applications. So, um, you know, I think you could assume that some of the funded applications might have been from rural areas, but, um, you know, it, it's, it's so hard to sort of look back and say it would have been X number in the urban communities and Y number in rural. Um, the fact is that between uh, not just the ACA, but looking back to the Bush folks and their expansion, we've seen a dramatic increase in the number of health centers since 2000 nationally. And we see them in rural areas we did not see them in in the late 90s, particularly in the upper Midwest and some of the more rural states. You had indicated when you discussed that the, the deficit deduction proposal caused changes with the RHC and critical access hospital changes. What were those particularly? Well, there were just, uh, there, there are proposals out there about whether the mileage standard should be changed for critical access hospitals, which have to be 35 miles from another hospital but there is a provision that allows some, some to be accepted from that mileage requirement. Um, so there are some, about 55, that are 10 miles from another hospital. So the Congress had proposed, CBO had scored, and the administration had proposed to um, take that away. In other words, remove the designation from those 10 miles or less. And so what I had referenced was the committee had sort of looked at the impact of that um, and what it would mean. And then there were other, you know, there have been a myriad of proposals around other rural hospital designations that the CBO had scored, getting, you know, eliminating Medicare dependent hospitals, sole community. Um, they weren't advocating it, they were just saying, if you do this, this is what would result in terms of savings. Uh, none of those proposals were acted on, they're all just sort of proposals at this point. Um, very quickly, uh, Maine uh, jumped on the potential to expand community health centers. Uh, during the Bush administration. And I think we did about as much expansion as we could support. Um, I, I worry now if we, if we expand many more health centers, whether we can recruit the staff for them. And uh, also the development of ACOs, and those of you who saw Keith's map, Maine looked really good. I mean, it was covered. <laughs> um, we, we do have ACOs developing, and what's, what's interesting is they don't seem to be talking to FQHCs very much because it is such a separate system. So expanding in Maine to, to more FQHCs um, worries me if, if, if the, the behemoth is going to be an ACL in the future. Yes, sir, go ahead. Al Milliken, AM Media. Do any of you identify any further significant uh, emergency room and ambulance services uh, changes? Uh, ch changes due to what? You mean future? What Present and future. future? Uh -huh. Yeah, maybe what you foresee possibly too, yeah. Well, can I jump in? I'm Please. Uh, no, go right ahead. <laughs> 
Um, we, we did a recent study in Maine because our ER use is very high. In rural areas, you know, ER use is very high. Um, the number one visit for ERs, particularly among Medicaid, was for dental and oral health care. Mm -hmm. So uh, we're not solving that with the ACA. Uh, there's some improvements. Um, but these two systems remain very polarized, not polarized, not polarized, wrong, wrong term, separate. You know, we've gotten our behavioral health system moving closer to primary care, but oral health is still out there uh, and they aren't integrated. I've talked to ACO people. Are you going to include oral health in your services? Oh, no, we don't do that. Uh, well, how are you going to impact your ER visits then? Um, so we, I don't know if other states have seen that, but there's, there's a lot of interplay between oral health and primary care in the ER. And right now the ACA is not yeah. addressing that. Yeah. I think there's a, uh, a real conflict that's going on now where some hospitals don't want to see those ER visits go down. That's where they get their business. That's how they fill their beds. And so in that regard, some of our strongest partners doing the most innovative work for prevention are actually the managed care organizations who save money by decreasing ER visits. When I've gone to hospital administrators, we talked about lots of innovations. One of them is a nurse advice line uh, in the state. It's the only one in the country, by the way. Um, and I asked the uh, hospital administrator, would you like to pay into this? So he said, tell me again, you're going to decrease me ER visits? Why would I support that? So we're in a transition of incentives. And as long as that transition you have, so in some regards, the more patients we see, we get more money. On the other hand, if we can cut down uh, the number of people seeking care, we save money. And until that's resolved and we're in this tr transition part, we're going to have this pull and tug. Can I ask Same. A, as a part of the follow-up, um, there was another question here, and I think it, it fills in with this, but first of all, with Lisa, uh, the direction of the dental provider in Maine, and there is a question asking if you could uh, speak to uh, how the efforts in Maine to authorize a new type of dental provider to go into the underserved areas, but at the same time, to follow up to get another question out of the same way, same discussion, is possibly for Dr. Kaufman, I know we talked about this earlier, but also including the role of pharmacist in supporting uh, chronic illness management and reducing the prevalence of chronic illness through wellness and health uh, reforms. Uh, these, both of these questions go to the discussion we've had about using other options of types of folks to help provide the care. I feel that the pharmacists are the most highly trained, underutilized uh, members of the healthcare team. Uh, the dilemma is the uh, money they make in retail pharmacy far exceeds what they can make uh, providing uh, patient care. There is a movement to increase clinical pharmacists. They're trained this way, but the jobs aren't there and the residencies aren't there for that. But when you look at their role in managing the most difficult diabetics, hypertensives, uh, they're incredible. We're so reliant on them. The other role is if you go to any community, who can you see? day or night for free. It's only the pharmacist. You go and say, what are you going to give, you know, I got a thing here, what can I do for this? And they'll give you some idea. You, know, you can go aisle six, you get a little thing and put it on. But you can't do that with a doctor. It's three months for away for, unless you go to the ER and a thousand dollar visit. So the pharmacist is, we're moving rapidly to try to incorporate them, but to overcome some of the barriers uh, I mentioned. Uh, hi, I'm Matt Brockmeyer with the States Alliance for Balance Insurance Regulation, and this kind of dovetails nicely with the last uh, response um, in, in terms of uh, changing the way we utilize different um, healthcare delivery professionals. So just wondered if somebody could um, comment on the current reimbursement status of telehealth and telemedicine um, after the Affordable Care Act and how that could potentially impact um, uh, some of the challenges unique to rural healthcare communities. Um, the Institute of Medicine right now has a report out on uh, telehealth from a meeting we, we supported with them last fall, and it addresses a lot of the reimbursement issues. The, the, uh, the ACA didn't change anything about the way telehealth services are paid for. Um, it remains the way it has uh, you know, for the last couple of years. Medicare is, uh, covers a, a, a small range of services. State Medicaid programs cover more. There's actually a resource guide out that will 
that sort of catalog the 50 states in which Medicaid programs cover and which don't. Private insurers have not really stepped up much outside of closed systems such as Kaiser. Probably the, the biggest innovation going on in telehealth right now, to my mind, is probably what's going on in the VA. Um, and then Keith and I have talked that, that you know, as he talks about ACOs and shared savings and, and we focus more on the outcome and less on, on site of service delivery, telehealth may be a more natural fit uh, with where healthcare is going than perhaps where it's been, where the concern is always on volume and the payment for that particular service. And some of the, the healthcare systems and organizations may be our early adopters of telehealth because they're seeing it as an investment strategy that helps them in their other approaches toward care management of patients, their other approaches toward making care more accessible, one of the leading examples being telehealth in an emergency room and what that does to bring a board certified physician into a virtual presence in the ER <clears throat> that starts out with a nurse practitioner or a PA that's physically on site at the time. <clears throat> and the, the payment support behind that is again those systems and organizations are accepting payment contracts that are global in nature and or they're participating in some sort of shared savings arrangement. So by lowering the overall cost through the use of telehealth, even though they're not getting paid directly for the telehealth service, they're seeing a financial gain to the bottom line of the organization. And I, I don't want to put Zane on the spot because I don't know if this is part of your area of, of uh, responsibility or expertise. But it does seem to me that, that private organizations like Centene getting global payments, as Keith was talking about, are in a position to use those payments in the most efficient way, including telehealth. And I wonder if that is something that you've been pursuing. Well, we, we utilize telehealth in uh, many of our markets. Um, as you stated, we are on a global payment uh, schedule. We just, we have to treat the whole person. And we have to find the right care, right place, right time. And so if telehealth is one of the, uh, the best practices that we can uh, utilize and bring to the table at that time and use, that's a part of the schedule of, of how we uh, serve the, the patients. And as far as we have contracts and we have uh, other ways of paying for those services, but certainly it's a part of the, uh, the, the considerations that we take in when we're looking at that. Yes, sir, it's a familiar face. <laughs> Bob Rohr, BMJ again for art. Uh, you, you mentioned uh, trying to tie in physicians, uh, pharmacists more, and, and use them. Uh, from what I've seen, though, the trend is almost in the opposite direction from insurers and payers, sort of the switch to centralized filling of prescriptions, mailing of drugs, giving incentives to patients to use this because it's more cost effective rather than, you know, use the local pharmacist. And so how are, how are you seeing these forces play out between what you'd like to do to make better use of, of these providers and, you know, the economic forces that are pushing towards a more centralized, you know, and non-accessible use of pharmacists. Uh, to me, uh, pharmacists are very, very highly trained. Uh, a lot of what they do in retail pharmacy can be done by farm techs. The problem is that the regulations in most states require that a pharmacist has to be there dispensing, uh, you know, face-to-face -face contact. So one is that you could have a pharmacist, and that, that's what we're now developing in New Mexico, where a, a farm tech can dispense, but if you have telehealth where the pharmacist can look at the prescription, look and talk to the patient that's waiting online, they can dispense. So you're keeping rural pharmacies open. That's one strategy. The second is that 52% um, of prescriptions in the United States are not filled. 50. So primary care, we write prescriptions, and we don't know until the patient comes back with diabetes out of control, hypertension out of control, that they didn't fill the medicine for a whole variety of reasons. So pharmacists are now taking roles in actually monitoring and informing the prescribing doctor when a patient doesn't pick up a prescription. When you start looking at how they could be used for, and then also with chronic care, really going over the details with patients uh, about that role. So I think it's something that's coming. You're absolutely right. Right now, everything is volume and it's fat. But I don't think that's what's going to improve the health very much. It, it does improve access, but uh, just for pharmaceuticals. But that's not the big intervention that has to happen. So every pharmacy school is trying to figure out how to get more of their graduates 
with uh, clinical pharmacy uh, certification and then finding through the reimbursement that's currently changing with the ACA how they become part of teams, just like we talked about with other uh, health providers. Uh, actually, uh, that raises a, a related question, it seems to me. Part of the way you're going to be able to use the pharmacist's expertise is, or the, the data that comes from that, is to be able to tap into data sources that will tell you that 52 percent are not being filled. And that, in turn, leads me to question something that was referred to earlier, and that is um, the collection of data in rural areas vis-a-vis uh, -vis what's going on in urban areas, uh, questions like, like uh, internet access and sufficient health information technology that are maybe as uh, a little a little more of a challenge in some of the rural areas, and I wonder what our panelists uh, might offer in the way of observations there. I guess I'll, I'll start reflecting on experiences in Nebraska, where I was until three years ago, and now Iowa. Uh, the the technology is less and less any kind of barrier, both in terms of the spread of access to uh, broadband capabilities and capacities. Uh, there's still some gaps out there, but they have shrunk considerably, and there are still some pockets of financial assistance available to help install the technology, either through USDA or through HHS at the federal level and a couple of major national foundations that are still investing in expansion of broadband capacity. The larger barriers are related to what is the incentive for the local provider, particularly if you move out to the small rural clinic or the small rural hospital, what's their incentive for taking the personnel time and investment required to both install a system and then learn how to use a system? And then what is the operational trade-off when they're investing that same capacity, both human and uh, capital, uh, over time? those alignments really haven't fallen into place yet. The Meaningful Use Incentive Program that was in the uh, legislation that was part of the Recovery Act has made a big difference. There are a lot of, um, I'm just visiting in another state, some rural practices for one of our research project, and one of my conclusions that, that surprised me at least a bit was every single one of them was meaning, meaningful use cat uh, classifications. And these were relatively small rural primary care practices. So that kind of an incentive program interfaced in their area with an active system has made a difference and, and moved them forward. Uh, uh, can I say something real quick? Here's a real practical incentive in Maine. Hospitals are not going to buy your practice if you are not willing to move into computer-based patient records. And so um, that is practically what's happening in Maine, and that is how a lot of rural practices are gearing up now, is that the hospitals are buying them. Of course, the FQHCs have been computer-based for, a, well, for their claims for a long time, and now their patient systems. So the reluctant rural practitioners in Maine will be retiring soon, I think. <laughs> and we, we are a very data-rich uh, state. We've had... Uh, we have all-payer claims data system, the first one in the country. We have one of the leading health information exchanges, patient information exchanges. We are now trying to merge them. So in a tiny rural state like Maine, it's going to be even more important to, to be able to access information through computers. So it's just inevitable uh, in our state. Okay. Um, we've got a question for Tom Morris. Uh, uh, what role does HRSA play in decisions regarding payment for providers in Medicare? And I guess I should add, what role would you like to play? <laughs> I think I'll ask the first part rather than the second. Um, the role we play is that we review all the regulations as they're developed each year for the payment updates. So we're not so much in a, in a, in a situation where we're setting the payment. What we're looking at is, as we think about um, how the payment is constructed, with the conditions of participation that regulate payment uh, that a provider has to meet are those taking into account unique rural circumstances. Um, 
does those sort of things we're trying to do just to make sure that it's a level playing field. Um, it, it, can, it can play out in a variety of different ways. Um, uh, for instance, you, you, you know, they may transition a certain payment because it has a negative impact on a certain provider class. Instead of doing the whole reduction in one year, they may space it out over five years to give time, people time to adapt to it. On the conditional participation side, it may look at, somebody may think, in a perfect world, you'd want somebody with a, um, an MBA to run a home health agency's business office. And that may make perfect sense sitting in an office here in Washington. may not make much sense sitting out in a very rural area when somebody's been doing that job for 10 years. And maybe they only have a high school degree or an associate degree, but they're doing a fine job. So what we try to do is just provide that sort of rural lens to say, you know, is this actually needed? Is it fair? And um, how does it fit into the rest of what we're trying to do with that particular regulation? Jim, you have a, an Sure. Right. Um, there's been a discussion uh, with regard to uh, a lot of primary care. This question asks us for to, to expand that. And I think Dr. Kaufman, in a prior conversation, this is something you might have addressed. But can you speak to the impact of access to mental health services on population health in rural areas? So about 40% uh, of what we see in primary care is behavioral health related. 40% uh, of the discharges from our hospital are related to alcohol and substance abuse. And of all the high utilizers, 70% of the underlying causes of those hospital discharges of those high users are behavioral health. And 70% of that is alcohol and substance abuse. So the question is, how do you get alcohol and substance abuse and behavioral health treatments into underserved areas? Back to our telehealth discussion, one of our booming telehealth uh, needs and resources is telepsychiatry. Um, I don't want to keep saying cooperative extension is everything, but it is everything. They've actually, I, I couldn't believe it. As part of our collaboration with them, their family consumer sciences actually train family counselors all over the state. They need to work more with supervision, so we're now having some of our psychiatrists do supervision with them. It's just another way of trying to increase uh, resources. It's not going to come through enough psychiatrists. It has to be other kinds of counselors, licensed uh, social workers who can do counseling. And also this mental health first aid can have a substantial impact. So I think you have to step back and look at what is available, who is there, and how can you train that resource. When you have more technical, difficult problems, you have to use telehealth. For, unfortunately, in New Mexico, there are so few places they can send someone who is very uh, ill. Uh, those doors are closed. And then what do we do? We leave community hospitals with this very, very difficult uh, patient to care for. The families are stressed. They have no place to go. So we have to accept this as a burden that we take on, not just them. It's very easy to say, gee, I'm sorry about that. We can't do that anymore. Yes, go ahead. And before you, you uh, ask your question, I might just say that between us, Zane and I have enough green cards to last through the weekend. <laughs> we are not going through the weekend. So if you really are absolutely dead set on getting your question addressed by the panel, I commend the microphones to you. Yes. My name is Barbara Levin, and I've just uh, retired from 33 years of one of the 40,000 National Health Service Corps people who stayed in their community. And I'm really impressed with your retention numbers. Um, I was in rural East Tennessee, and the thing that hit me the most were the people who came and went for two years, which really decreased the, um, the reliance of our population and our community on those types of people, because they didn't really want to have someone who just came for that short period of time. I'm wondering, with your, it's good what you're doing with the short term. Is there something that we can do, and do it a lot earlier, to address um, De redefining um, rural practice is something that will be, I don't want to use the word as supported, but as that you will get some sort of ongoing uh, recognition that this is a very important role to have. Uh, one of the things that Lisa brought out was that as the ACOs developed, there are going to be fewer and fewer people working where I was working in a, in a community health center. And the second thing is that all these issues around telemedicine, if there is no one out there to turn on the TV, you don't have anything. So I'm here to say that it's very, very important that we work on this retention and we work earlier and we identify to all those young doctors who are going to primary care medical schools 
that there really is something there because most of them are graduating fewer than 10% of people who go into primary care. Thank you. Let me just add something because I think it's so, what you said is so important. We looked at our data over the last 30 years. If you come from a rural area, you're six times as likely to go to a rural area. But to do that, you have to change your admissions procedures to all the health professions, and that's tough when an admissions committee likes to clone themselves, but we're changing that. The second is, if you're from an ethnic minority in our state, your likelihood is even higher. And if you've trained, if you come, you graduated from high school in our state, and you went to college and medical school, it's even higher. So we're putting those factors in to try to change this whole na notion of who we're taking in. It's not how we're going to look good on U.S. News and World yeah, news, Report and those, you know, high scores. It's do we get graduates where they're needed around the state. The second is where they train and how you support those sites, like the service core sites. Now, what we're finding is if you can make them much more academic units, it means the, ha the center of training is decentralized. We're finding for the National Service Corps, FQHCs, those have become highly desirable, even though the pay is lower, because it fulfills another yearning that graduates have of doing something important in communities. Right. Just to say, I'm from Berlin, New Mexico, <laughs> so. <laughs> did, did you meet the Heinrichs person? <laughs> Anyone else? Well, can I ask a follow-up question? Yes, go ahead. Part of her question was uh, also about the what incentives might there be for the short term as well? I mean, that's the long-term goal of getting the graduates into practice and into the rural areas. What can we be doing now to guarantee that there's some state power to, to be involved rurally now and to incentivize maybe the hospitals, as Lisa said, that are actually hiring the providers to, to participate in that practice? C certainly in the short term, um, I think rural clinicians have got to bite the bullet and decide that teaching and training is also part of their responsibility. And there's, you know, this, I live with a rural physician, you know, there's a lot of whining about, oh, life is so hard. But um, guess what? He was, he was an urban child who had a rural health center experience at UC San, San Diego. And he lives in a town of 500 people now and practices in a rural health center. There was something magical about that experience in rural San Diego County that flipped him. And those experiences are very, very important. And I think rural practices and rural hospitals and larger community hospitals have got to be very purposeful about preparing clinicians to be teachers as well in those settings to unveil and portray the wonderful life and the embeddedness in community. If you're seeking community, you need to be a rural physician. I just add a, a state example in Nebraska where I was previously. Uh, the state has had for a couple of decades now a highly successful pipeline program that brings all of these pieces together, starting with introducing the sciences to elementary age students, so the, the university sponsors an eighth grade science fair, all the way through admissions policies that favor people that come from rural places, uh, shortening the length of time that it takes for them to go from entering the, the undergraduate college to completing their medical training, including rural residency training tracks, including resi training tracks during their undergraduate and then residencies and they've been at it long enough that before I left there, we were beginning to see the data of the eighth grade science fair students who are now practicing clinicians uh, in rural places. And it's that kind of comprehensive approach. Any one of those pieces is important, and I agree that each one of them, there's some data that says this increases the prospect. But combining them all into a single pipeline program, adding in some elements of loan repayment is sort of the sweet spot we should be looking for. Because the only thing I would add is you folks have said it nicely, but it's a workforce is not a federal responsibility and it's not solely a state responsibility. It's a shared responsibility that also includes local communities. And so that continuum of, of activities is really critical. And there are a pocket full of states and programs that have really figured out. There are just not enough of them. Uh, you know, the, our, our last question referred back to something Lisa Miller was saying, and that is that. FQHCs are finding themselves a 
a little bit behind the curve in being acquired anyway in what looks like the coming wave of consolidation. Um, I wonder if that's more generally true across the country, uh, to your knowledge, or is it something that is unique to certain specific areas? Well, one, one thing I might add is just, you know, FQHC is an incredible part, important part of the safety net. Rural health clinics, which are just a payment designation under Medicare, also critically important. They're both paid differently than we pay physician practices, and that's a good thing because it's a recognition that's been in place for 25 years that they needed cost-based reimbursement in order to get the providers out there and ensure access to care. But as we've moved into these new models where, like ACOs, we've had to figure out how to blend people we pay on a fee-for-service basis with how we pay for folks in a cost-based environment, and it's, it's very difficult. And as a result of that, that's where you see some of the issues I think Susan was referring to about it's harder to bring them into the loop sometimes. But folks are figuring out workarounds around it. Uh, FQHCs are moving to a prospective payment system, which will include claims level data, so that will help. So I think that things are going to get better in that regard, but it, it has been a bit of a challenge. There, uh, on the CMS website, you can, and CMMI, you can see some data about how many critical access hospitals, FQHCs, and RHCs are currently participating in ACOs. The numbers are very, very small, but they are there. So one of the things that we need to understand is how did that work for those ACOs and those FQHCs, and can we spread that knowledge around more? I mean, the whole genre is still so new that there's plenty, there is time and opportunity for those organizations to come together, but a lot of that's going to have to happen at the local level again among the organizations. It's not something that a policy lever is going to make happen. Yes. Hi, uh, my name is Casey Tilton with the Association of American Medical Colleges. Um, my question is, is specifically for Dr. Mueller. Um, had a question about, or you had mentioned briefly programs that had been implemented in Iowa to promote uh, doctors practicing in rural areas, specifically for medical schools. Um, can you mention a little bit more about that and what impact you s that they've had so far? Um, in Iowa, there are two things that, that have occurred. One of the examples I just gave about pipeline was from my previous iteration in, in Nebraska. Uh, in Iowa, there are two particular initiatives that are very new. Uh, one of those is a, a loan repayment and incentive initiative that the governor uh, promoted this year in the legislature enacted. So there are some state resources being devoted to incentives to get healthcare professionals to distribute more uh, across the state. And the other is from the University of Iowa's Medical College, which has also created a loan repayment program for its graduates that go out and practice in uh, rural underserved areas. Both of those are still pretty new, so I don't have the advantage of a lot of evidence, like the example I gave in Nebraska where the program's been in place longer and in, again, in Nebraska, it's a full pipeline that starts with uh, activities at elementary school and goes all the way through the admissions process, education, and residency. We have only about five minutes, so I would ask you as we go through this last Q&A or two to pull out those blue evaluation forms and um, fill them out as you listen. Yes, you may have the last question here. <laughs> Um, Hannah Kessler with United Health Group. I was just wondering what some of the biggest challenges you find are with um, children's health in rural areas. What are the biggest challenges that you guys see? I, I wonder if you could say that again a little more Sorry. closely to the microphone. I'm wondering what you think the biggest challenges for children's health in particular are in rural areas. Okay. Who's down there first? Children's health? Poverty. Plain and simple, poverty. The, the, uh, the rise in poverty uh, uh, among children in Maine is um, pretty astounding lately. And I, I'm not entirely certain what it all is, but certainly the recession is not, has not helped. Um, and I just, it just stands out to me all by itself. I would add to that, I absolutely agree. Uh, you know, if a parent is uninsured, that child who has Medicaid gets 20 to 25 percent less care because the parents are not connected to a system. And the stress that parents are under affects children. Um, in our state, we have a very large undocumented population. 
and uh, that is not is not covered by any of the ACA or any other. And there's a constant struggle. Uh, they're a vital part of our economy, and even most of those kids who were born in the United States are um, have Medicaid, but their parents are always threatened with being deported, and so the stress level is extremely high. The other I'd say is it's an age-dependent issue. Um, most uh, family docs, pediatricians, see young children. When you get to be teenagers, who the heck wants to see a doctor? They're so needy, but you can't find them. That's why you have to set up school clinics. You have to go where they are, because they're gonna keep away from you as much as they can, and yet the needs and the transitions are so high at that point. Thanks, Zane. Zane, you have a final question for us? To well, uh, just Juan as a follow-up, possibly to that, uh, to dig a little bit deeper into what Dr. Kaufman just said, you know, access and navigation to care is one of the largest problems that they have in the, the children-based populations. But with that, you discuss the school-based health centers. And I know New Mexico uh, utilizes school-based health care. And how do you view that, uh, getting back to some of the questions that were brought up about screening and then the follow-up care? Because screening is a detection, but what do you do to make certain you get access to care? So we said, I think we have one of the highest rates of school-based clinics in the state. Uh, and we started with students and residents, and then when they stayed in state and went to rulers, they set up their own clinics. And what was interesting to us is what we found. Uh, when we polled all the providers, what's the number one problem in teen health, for example, because most of these are high school clinics. And we said, it's really teen pregnancy. But when we asked the kids, that wasn't their number one issue. Their number one issue was feeling social exclusion. There's a fate, nothing is as bad as being excluded from a group. That's a fate worse than death. And so they were dealing with behavioral issues, and so we had to change the nature of what we did in those schools. Oh yeah, we deal with the behavioral. But we really had to go into classrooms and do a lot of counseling, brought in our other counselors, uh, because that's the real issue. And it's closer to what the real risks are for those families. And then dealing with the local families is critical. So the whole nature of what those school health programs uh, provide has changed. Okay. Yeah. Well, uh, I think we've, we've covered a lot of ground. We've left a lot of ground to be covered. Uh, but uh, I, I want to thank you for some wonderful questions, including the ones we didn't get a chance to address. Uh, thank our colleagues at Centene for participating in and helping support this briefing. And um, thank our panel for, uh, I think, a wide-ranging discussion and ask you to help me thank them uh, in the appropriate manner. And consider this a telethon-like plea to help us meet our 50% evaluation <laughs> return goal.